My name is Earl Theobald. Uh, anybody calls me by my nickname, Mickey. I'm 96 years old. I'm a veteran of the European Theater of World War II. I was born on November the 29th, 1915, and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Before the war, I was an automobile mechanic, working mostly on Ford dealerships. My parents were Charles and Mary Theobald, and I have two sisters, two brothers, and five sisters survived. Today, I live in Covington Retirement Community in Sharonville, Ohio, near Cincinnati. I live with my wife, Marie, and have been married for 68 years. We're okay. Let me take this off. And my, service it number, my service number is 333-403-20, and my MOS was, was infantry. The 83rd Division was originally a Ohio unit, and it was a signal with the letters O-H-I-O overlaid on top of another one another. For a long time after the war, uh, the National Guard had used its signet in Springfield, Ohio, Springdale, Ohio. My basic training was at Camp Atterbury in southern Indiana. I arrived there by train, and I was there for 13 weeks basic training, seven weeks of advanced training, and three weeks of ranger training. We lived in two-story wooden barracks. It was practically particularly cold that winter. I remember watching the snow and no meal freezing our mess kit. I could only, we could only wear GI issued clothes, even the shoes, and we drilled with an M1 rifle. My number was 78026. I was paid $50 a month as a private. I left pirate, left basic training as a corporal. During basic training, I got one furlough and went home to Philadelphia. A typical day was really a 5.30 breakfast, training problems, also known as maneuvers, battalion and attack, quad and attack, obstacle course, and lots of hiking. One challenge, the hike was 15 miles with a full field pack and rifle. The hike was to be covered nine miles cross country in two hours. I made it in two hours and three minutes. I left my pack downstairs and scrolled up the stairs to my bunk upstairs. Another exercise, exercise was run with tank running over a foxhole to show that we could survive that. I remember driving that tank for half a day. My advanced training was motor school in Fort Benning, Georgia. I arrived there in late March of 1943. We changed from winter dress to summer dress right after I got there. Since I was all over the mechanics and civilian life, this was pretty easy. I remember one test to set a certain voltage and amperage on the generator. I did successfully, but because I didn't refer to the manual, when I did it, I failed the test. That was the only test I failed. After motor school, we had maneuvers in Tennessee. This was field maneuvers, red team against the blue team. We also had maneuvers at Camp Breckenridge in Kentucky. These maneuvers, I think I missed one. My wife. Three months. My wife Marie and I got married on January 7th, 1944. We had become engaged in August of 43 during a furlough from Camp Breckenridge, but Marie had to buy her own engagement ring because we didn't have time to do it together. After a wedding and quick honeymoon in New York City, I returned to Camp Breckenridge. I was 24 hours late returning from my furlough and as punishment, I was assigned charge of quarters duty for a full week. Our unit was shipped to Camp Shanks in the Hudson River in New York to prepare for deployment overseas. And among other training at Shanks, we practiced climbing rope ladders aboard and unboard ships. We left Camp Shanks for England in March 1944. There was about 8,000 troops on His Majesty's ship, the Orient. I think about, think it took about nine days in convoy. During the second day of the trip over, I saw one foreign boy from Ohio 
Oh, I uh, looked him out in the front of the ship. When I asked what he was looking for, he said, Europe. Those boys from the Midwest had no idea how bad the big Atlantic Ocean is. Our uh, first con no, mm -hmm. must be a boat shuttle up and got one part. Liverpool. Oh, yeah. We lived, landed in New Liverpool in Markheim until the invasion. We camped in Kent's on Newcastle on the line. At one point, we went to the Wales for some more maneuvers. At the point I was a truck driver, for I had driven cheap, three quarter ton, ton, ton and a half, and two and a half ton. I had also had time driving in amphibious jeeps. One interesting exercise was waterproofing our trucks to drive underwater. We had a coat of, we had to coat the distributor spark plugs and gauges and snaps, a hose and a carburetor to keep the water out. If the truck didn't make it through the the lake, the driver had to wait out, attach the tow line to re re reset it in. My unit landed on Utah Beach on June 17, 1944, which was 11 days after D-Day. I was hoisted from the hull of a ship the driver was, as a driver of a two and a half ton ammunition truck and placed on a pontoon beach headed to the beach. I drove there, I drove that truck for three days, be turning it over and picking up a Jeep. My unit relieved the 101st Airborne Division at Carrington. They were very glad to see us. The story of us relieving the 101st is in the book of Band of Brothers. Our first contact with the Army, the enemy was July the 4th, and we got clobbered. I drove my team. Chief for Lieutenant Cofield. Reports of the 1st Battalion kitchens, aid stations, headquarters, and transported radios and other materials. About this time, Lieutenant Cofield was a grease one, which was an automatic rifle. One day, he jumped in the Jeep with a safety off his finger on the trigger, and he fired a burst right in front of my face. I had some fine words for him that day. We were in the hedgerow until the 25th of July, when the Allies bombed the German lines for eight hours, and we broke out of the hedgerows. And normally I was driving with Lieutenant Cofield, and we encountered the German tank on the road. The tank fired and blew off the left rear tire of the Jeep. I jumped out and hid the field behind the cardboard box. Another day I was between the Jeep trailer and a hedgerow. A German machine gun blew out the tire on the trailer with a loud bang, and I thought it was hit in the head, but no damage. Another time, and normally, a, a listed man and I were arranged and assigned to destroy a German panzer tank that was abandoned. We shot it three or four times with a bazooka, but it didn't do much damage. We then got it. Five gallons of gasoline and poured down the hatch, set it on fire with a thermite grenade. We thought we could jump off the, and run away before the grenade went off, but we only got about 20 feet away when the whole thing blew up and knocked us flat. The turret went up in the air like a, like a manhole cover, and then at the 88 score tank, caliber tank shells started igniting. It was quite a show for the next few minutes. One other story, we were in a small convoy when a flight of planes approached. Someone had said there was no problem because they were P-47s. I saw them and yelled, Fox Wolves, and jumped out of the, my Jeep as the enemy planes had stretched the convoy. Our unit went to St. Malo and took the Citadel which was an ancient fort. This was part of the Battle of, of Friedel, Friedel Gap, and we sat on the beach near St. Malo and watched our artillery shells. The German island held for Zambri 
For nearly a month, the two had surrendered. We couldn't invade the island because the mines on the harbor and on the beach. I, mean, I got a picture of this. In August, we were in Angiers, France, but the Germans were already abandoned there. We went through Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg for the rest of the summer, going from town to town. Our next big fight was the Battle of the Hurtman Forest. There was snow on the ground, so it was probably in November. The artillery burst, splintered the trees, and we lost a lot of men. We were with a British unit there. I was new, then driving Lieutenant Francis Xavier Murphy, a devoted Roman Catholic who was the best officer in the Army. Murphy never asked me to do anything he wouldn't do himself. I remember spending my 29th birthday on November 29th, 1944 in a hostel, doing the show and I think this was one hell of a way to spend a birthday. I only remember receiving a month package from home while I was in Europe. That was from my sister Yvonne during the Battle of Bold and it came shoe polish and shoe brush. Since the snow was about a foot deep, I didn't have much use for the shoe polish. My wife sent, a, sent an identification bracelet, bracelet, asked the letters how I liked it. I never saw the bracelet. I remember when we arrived in Luxembourg around November or December, the 83rd Division was greeted by Axis Sal within 24 hours of our arrival. Axis Sal was a radio personality from Berlin who played all the latest American music. The idea was to lessen our morale for testing us when we go home with our wives and girlfriends. I don't know how we knew she was in Luxembourg before we did. Around that time, I remember getting a plate of ice cream in Luxembourg. I'll shut it down. On Christmas Eve of 1944, we were outside of Aachen. We were chilled, called out in an open field to watch for German paratroopers. Intelligence said they were trying to explain the bulb, but no paratroopers appeared. Santa Claus didn't fly either. The next day, when it was Christmas Day, we were supposed to rest, but at 11 a.m. we went through Liège, Belgium, on the way to the Bulge. The Germans were firing V-1s into Liège. They would fly over, making a loud buzzing sound, then shut up and fall into the city. I don't know exactly where they were doing. We were just doing the Bulge. It was extremely low, well below zero degrees, maybe as low as 20 below. Ice froze in the canteens and the rifles mechanism froze. After the Battle of the Bolt, we took the city of Dusseldorf, which I remember was not damaged too much. We crossed the Rhine River on a pontoon bridge set up by the British. After the Bolt, we advanced about 10 or 12 miles each day. We crossed the Elbe River on the Truman Bridge. At that time, President Roosevelt had died and Harry Truman was president. It was around the end of April. We did not go further than the Elbe River while the Russians took Berlin. That was our last act and the war ended in April and May 7th. Overall, was the combat from June 1944 until May 1945. I received a combat infantry badge for which I received an extra $10 a month. I also received a bond star for evacuating vehicles under fire in Norman. The medal provided me with extra 10 points for discharge in October. In August 10, 1945, I was in Grasso when I heard about the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. My first reaction was the American propaganda. But I never heard a bomb. That could cause that much destruction. During the occupation period, I went to Czechoslovakia, attached to the 8th Armored Division, where we helped to evacuate some of the vehicles. 
I was returned to La Havre, France in October by train on a 48, which was a freight car which carried 40 men or eight horses. And I returned to the United States to Newport News, Virginia on the USS America. Other campaigns for the 81st Division were the Ruhr Valley, the Harsh Mountains and the Ruhr Valley. I was part of a quartering party which set up the kitchens and other support. The Harsh Mountains were clear near the Black Forest. After the war, I saw General Patton give us a speech to thank us for the support of his armored division. We didn't receive mail very often. I often got several letters at once and then read them in order to find out what was happening back home. I never sent free mail. I, I saw Bob Hope and Glenn Miller Band and U.S. Social in Munich, Germany. I often about think some about the men I served with. I especially remember Rock's boys from Port Allegheny, Pennsylvania, Big Jim Hughes from Georgetown, Kentucky, and Lieutenant Murphy from Back Bay, Boston, Al Kremen from Baltimore, Maryland, Lou Jones from Philadelphia, and Jack Temple from Philadelphia. That's it. Vicki, mm -hmm. can you tell us anything about your experience with that outhouse? Oh, <laughs> well, we had to, we, is that shut off? No, I want it longer. <laughs> <laughs> We were in uh, some some place in Germany, a place in Germany, and uh, we had diarrhea. We had got bad food. The food had gone bad, and we got diarrhea. Everybody had diarrhea, and there was a, a road running down with houses on both sides, and they were all blown up. And behind the house, about thirty feet, there was an outhouse, a cement outhouse. I never saw one before or since, but it had three walls and uh, the back on it, but the seat was still there. And I'm sitting there on the seat, too weak to move, really, and a uh, Falk Wolf 190 come down the road, straight from the road out in front of the house. And I thought, this is just a hell of a way to get killed. <laughs> but it, it, it was shooting in the street, but there was a house between me and the outhouse. So, I mean, I, there wasn't anything in it really it came anywhere close to me, really. But it was just the idea of sitting there and seeing that fog wall coming right down, right down at you. And wonder, wonder if you're going to make it. Shut it off. <laughs> Kicking at the mortar top, and you know, when I shouldn't have. I, it was just laying on top. I thought it was just laying on top of the ground. I thought it blown off the back of the mortar. It was just laying there. And I was sitting there, and I kicked the roof. I, I still remember, I kicked the roof with my right foot, and my, my foot stopped. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't off the back, it was still on. Now, the mortar must have been completely in the ground, because it just looked like the back of the, the thing was sitting there, you know? And I just thought it was blown off the back, so I kicked it, and it, it wasn't blown off. Some of the stupid things you did, you know. I guess that's about all. I, that's, 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 one of the, that day we went in the in the Mount Dole, we were lost. There were seven jeep drivers. I was there was about two to three men in the jeep. I was just the lieutenant and I, and we went into this place and, and we it was down down about five or six miles down this road. And we got to this little town. It wasn't a big, very big town. And all these people were out greeting, greeting us saying, I had flowers that day that I couldn't hold with my two hands like that. Gladiolus mostly, that big around. In fact, after the thing was over, they took a picture of me holding these things. But I mean, we couldn't get it developed anyway, so it didn't make any difference, you know. We never got to see the pictures. But uh, they were coming out and they were kissing us and, giving us wine, bottles of wine, and and all these flowers and all. Come to find out, we were the first ones in the town. And what was the name of the town? Dole, Mount Dole. Mount Dole. Mount Dole. We were supposed to be in Dole, which the town was about four or five miles across it. 
But we got into uh, like a suburb of it, uh, off to the side, and it was called Mount Dole. So uh, the lieutenant got us lost. The, the guy reading the map <laughs> didn't know where he was at. Another time, talking about getting getting lost, we were uh, in Normandy, and uh, we were up on the lines, and they had captured two two Germans, and they wanted to take them back to headquarters, the battalion headquarters to question them. So uh, they said, we'll take you back on your jeep. And so this first sergeant of uh, A Company, he said, I'll guard him. He said, I gotta go back to headquarters, at the battalion headquarters anyway. So we got in the jeep and we went back and we were going down this little lane and there was guys in holes there with the rifles pointing in our direction, you know? So I, I just thought, you know, the reserve or something, you know? So we didn't think of anything. Oh, we got down to the, the headquarters, and the lieutenant, this uh, sergeant got out, he said, Lieutenant, he said, the next time we go anywhere, I'll read the map. He said, <laughs> they were my men on the lines. He said, and I'm on the front lines. We were in front of them. He got read the map wrong. We were supposed to be back somewhere else. I said, we were going right down the guy's lane there to hold the rifles for the passion. So what did it get killed just for the mistakes that were made? It was it was it was stupid. It was the whole thing was stupid. But I guess What kind of truck driver were you? Huh? What kind of truck driver were you? Well, I don't know. I we were uh, I don't want to tell me about right that with a jury do you? No, don't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Talk about trying to back up the truck down the road. <laughs> oh, we went up. They, we had the trucks and we picked up a trailer, a cherry trailer. It was a farm trailer and it pivoted. It had a, a pivot on it so the horses like it turned around. And, and so they hooked it on the back of my Jeep. We were carrying a gas in it. So we're going down this road and, and the first thing they stopped and this uh, sergeant came back and said, the bully said, uh, I made a mistake. He said, we're supposed to be in that road down there. He said, we're supposed to make a turn. I said, well, God damn, you better find a big field because I sure can't back this thing up. We had to find a big field. And we went up there and the field had said, they had signs up and said, Achtung Miner, which means attention mines, you know. And I don't think there was any in it. Because we had to turn around and I, hell, I couldn't back that thing up. I pivoted back on the truck and I pivoted in the trailer. I had it all over the turn. I said, you, you'll find a big field that will make a U-turn. That's the only way, only way I can drive it back. <laughs> then uh, and when we were in uh, Dusseldorf, we were going across the, the Rhine River. The Rhine River was there. And Jerry was on one side, we were on this side. And so they decided we we're going to make a crossing. So they called up three amphibious six, six, I think it was four or six amphibious jeeps all the way from the coast, all the way up to Dusseldorf. They drove them up. We we're going to make a crossing across on these amphibious ducks. So what they do, they get four of us to learn to drive these ducks. So we spent about four days taking them into the lake and across the lake and up the other side. And they have uh, uh, valves for re tire. And you can inflate or deflate the tire. So if you're on the sand and you, you want to deflate the tire, right, and, get a better, and when you get on the hard top, you want to blow it back up. So we spent about, I guess we spent three or four days doing that. And I said to him, I said, why the hell should we learn this? They drove them up. They know how to do it. But that's as far as they were going. They weren't going to go across the river. We were going to go across. But then we did have to go across. The British made a pontoon bridge. And we went up across to the pontoon bridge. So I didn't have to drive that damn duck across the Rhine River. But that kind of stuff is stupid. Those guys drove them things about 400 miles. And then they all they wouldn't take them across the river. That's as far as they were going. <laughs> in Normandy, we had a, a, a colored fella from uh, Ordnance come up. He, 
he brought a load of ammo up and uh, he got up to our company, which was about four or five miles behind the line at the time. And he said, I said, to well, this, they said, this is where we went to ammo. We went up a battalion. And uh, he said, well, he said, I know frontline nigger. I'm a war court, quartermaster nigger. This is as far as I go. <laughs> he wouldn't go. They told me, I said, take him up and show him where to take it. He wouldn't go. We had to put one of our drivers in to take the truck out. What could you do? What could you do? Lock him up? You know, what the hell? If he got locked up, he'd been safer than going up in the front line. But he said, I was, I'm a quartermaster nigga. I'm no front line nigga. He said, oh, of course, everybody's, there was segregation then, you know, so it's everybody called them niggers, you know. And I guess somebody called him a nigger or something. You know, hey, nigger, get in that truck or something. He said, I ain't no, I ain't no front line nigger. I'm a quartermaster nigger. As far as it goes. Did, did you see a lot of that in the service? We didn't see any colored. That, I saw that colored fella in one, one uh, uh, MP at a crossroad. That's the only colored we ever saw. And I never saw a nurse or a whack. Of course, we were too far forward. The nurses were always, always I guess they were back at hospitals or something. Yeah. The furthest back we ever got was an aid station. You know, then, then they were transported from there back somewhere else. But uh, Normandy, and uh, one night, the Germans got around behind us and captured our aid station and took everybody that could walk from that aid station, doctors and all, and the only ones they left were the ones that couldn't walk in the aid station. We forgot them the next morning. But they, they captured the aid station, took every, all the wounded and everything, and took every, all the doctors and all. They didn't leave anybody. Hmm. <clears throat> Things that happened. It's stupid, really. Another time, we were, we were up somewhere in Normandy in the hedgerows, and we were headed, uh, the hedgerows, I don't know, the hedgerow is about, oh, I'd say five or six feet tall, and they had brush growing up on them. They were four, four hundred years old, you know, they didn't build fences, they just built a blockade so the cow couldn't go from one thing to the other. And at the end of it, they would bring those uh, stuff growing on the top, and they dig like footholes in it, like steps in it, so you could, the farmer could go from one place to the other. So we were up there, I don't know where we were, somewhere in Normandy, and somebody cut loose with a machine gun, and uh, they were flying around, and this other kid and I head for this opening to get in over the, uh, the other side, and he got there first and got up on the top, and he caught one through the arm. I pushed the poor bugger, I pushed the poor bugger over the hedgerow and ran over behind him. I, I don't know how bad he was hit, but he got the, apparently got it in the arm because he grabbed his, arm, his, his left arm with his right arm and hollered, but I wasn't stopping there. I was on the wrong side of the hedgerow. I pushed the poor bugger across. <clears throat> and that, at the time we met the tank, they were shooting, the, they had shot the big gun, their big cannon, and knocked out at one of our anti-tank guns, which was there. And apparently they were reloading. When I pulled into the, the field, when they blew out my tire, I pulled into the field and there was another Jeep sitting there, facing out. And it had a 50 caliber mounted on a post. And there was two kids up on the top of it shooting at this tank. Well, the gun jammed and they dropped, jumped off. And I, I don't know where they were. And then the tank cut loose with a, with a big gun. It hit that Jeep, the Jeep was facing them. Hit that Jeep in the left front, went right, I don't know what it did to the motor, but right through the gas tank, took the gas hand off the back, dug a furrow in the ground and ricocheted off the, into space. And of course the whole thing jumped blew up in a big flame, you know. But they had, that thing, was, I guess was armor piercing. 
was it never exploded. It did explode. I, and most of the tanks carried out our piercing because they were fighting tanks, you know, so I apparently was a, but it went right through that, to front of that Jeep, right through the gas tank underneath the seat, and kept right on going. Mm. Never even, never even slowed it down. <laughs> <clears throat> that, but that was, oh, I'd say 40 feet from where I was. Can you remember anything about the, the program that Patton had when he talked to you fellows? No, except he was the dirtiest mountain man I ever ran into in my life. I, I, he, I, he was so dirty mouth, I was disgusted with him, i be honest with you. I didn't like the guy, because every time we Patton wanted to make a move, we lost a lot more men than if we, we were just ordinary. But he was always in such a big rush to get where he was going to go, and it, he made a statement that he'd take Metz in France on a frontal attack if it took two truckloads of dog tags. Now that's a lot of men. Now you know he wasn't worrying about how many men he lost. <laughs> I, I just don't like, I don't like him, especially when the, when it was raining like a son of a gun and you have to ride the jeep with the top down and the windshield down. Now, that didn't make sense at all to me. And then in Normandy, when he come up, he made a statement that every man under his command would shine their shoes and shave every day. God damn, mud was foot deep. Couldn't see your shoes, let alone shine them. It so sounds like the Army, doesn't it? I stepped out of the Jeep one day, and the captain was there, and I got back to the company from the lines, and I, I stepped out of the Jeep, and the captain said to me, Theobald, did you shave the day? He said, oh, well, I hadn't shaved in a week, you know. I said, Captain, I have found enough water today to get a drink, let alone shave. But he was just egging me on, you know, he knew it. He knew damn well I didn't have to shave. But he would make an order, how the hell are you going to shave? You know, hell, you did. I would rather have a toothbrush than a razor, you know, than you have a toothbrush. He was nuts. He was, he was a glory hound. He was a real glory hound. He said, when you get back to the States, when we had Eisenhower, they issued an Eisenhower jacket to come home, and they weren't in the States. And he said, when you get back, he said, don't tell them they're Eisenhower, he said, tell them they're kiss my ass jacket, he said, because they hadn't got over the fighting. Oh, you know, that, that kind of stuff wasn't necessary. He's just foul about. Boy, he called them everything in the world. He, was he had there? all the mothers and... <clears throat> He was there with his pearl uh, handled pistols. Yeah, yeah, and a, and a, a shiny helmet, chrome, chrome plated helmet. And he always complained to us about not camouflaging anything, and he wore a polished helmet. And flashy stuff. <clears throat> he, was, he was a nut. I, I, I always said the greatest man in the world was the kid that hit him with a truck and killed him. <laughs> he was he was a nut. That's crazy. <clears throat> oh, I hope I hope that does you some good. Mickey, would you explain how you could acquire points and how many points were required for you to cycle out of the front lines and maybe uh, be sent back to to the mainland? Well, you got uh, in the states, you got one point for each month you were in service, and when you got overseas. You got two points for every month you were in service. And then if you got any uh, decorations of any kind, you got 10 points for that. So you had to have 83 points, 85 points to come home. Because when the war was over, I only had 83, but they were cycling people home early, so they recycled me home on 83 points. But the Bronze Star got me 10 extra points. You had to, to get the, the combat infantry badge. Now you had to be in the front line under small arms fire and would either could shoot you with a rifle or a machine gun for, I forget whether it was six or eight weeks before you could get that. That's that 
blew, blew it up on the top. And then that would be 10 points? No, that wasn't 10 <clears throat> points. That was just 10, ten dollars more a month. You, oh, got, ten. you got ten dollars more a month called combat pay. <clears throat> but you didn't get any points for that. And I thought I'd been hit because it was burning. And I figured it there was blood because when I was a kid, I used to read pulp magazines, westerns. And it said he got shot in the arm, he could feel blood running down his arm, hot blood. So when this thing is burning in my middle of my back, I thought it was hit and the blood was coming out. But it was only hot from the explosion where it came over and just landed on my back. It didn't even break the skin. But that was as close I as close as I guess I ever got. Oh it's, it's that far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I was laying in a hole and it came over and it hit me on the back. In fact, there was a piece about that big. I carried it in my pocket for a couple months. I don't know what ever happened to it, but I kept thinking to myself, boy, that sucker is pretty close. But I didn't, I don't know what's going on, but I lost it. How many months were you in the service? 37. I was in 37 months. <clears throat> I was in 19 months overseas. I went over and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, well, we, I went over in March of 43, and I came back in, yeah, in October of, of 44. Huh? You went over in March of 44, because you're on the beach in June. Yeah, that's right, 44. Yeah, that's right. Went over in 44, and I come back in 45. That's right. Yeah, hit the beach in June. Good. We were in Normandy, we were unloading mortar cases off a truck. And uh, they hear bullets buzz past your head, they sound like bees. So we thought it was a, a sniper, so we jumped down in, in a hole and waited till a while, and, we didn't hear anything, you get up and finally we got them all unloaded and got off of there. And uh, we were going down this one looking for a sniper to a, this orchard. We didn't find him, but we got down to the end of it and uh, we come to a place that like an opening there and there was four guys laying dead, American soldiers dead in this area. And there was one uh, staff sergeant, he was a, a supply sergeant for one of the companies, and he was leaning, laying over the mortar cases with his arms outstretched as though he was going to pick up a mortar when the guy got, the sniper got him. And we couldn't find him, they didn't find him. And they finally found him. He was, uh, uh, they know how you put a couple boards across the ditch to go from the road to the field? He was laying underneath there, and they were shooting him from underneath there. He was still under there. He was dead when I saw him, but he was still under there. They hadn't gotten him out yet. But he got five men in that little area. We got not looking for snipers. And, and it's, of course, back today, I mean, they shoot you for a thousand from a thousand yards, but then they only shot you, you know, three or four hundred yards most of the time. But going through an orchard looking for snipers, boy, that, that is a did, I'll tell you. There's better ways of spending the day than that. Uh, and and uh, one, we were going up by St. Malo. I was going through an orchard one day, and there was a German hanging from a tree, an apple tree. Now, I don't know whether one of my guys hung him or whether he committed suicide. There was no buckler underneath him where he hung himself. Now, whether the Germans hung him, Americans hung him, I don't know, but he was hanging from a tree. It looked real gruesome, real gruesome. He was swinging to the little breeze. And that was really, really, I, that was worse than seeing him laying dead in the ground, hanging from that tree. I, we, I don't know how he got in the tree. I, it, I don't think he committed suicide because there was no box or anything under him, you know. 
and the street was off the ground about a foot and a half. So it, somebody hung him up. Maybe some GI got bad. They hung him. I don't know. But it was it was gruesome looking just him hanging there. Uh, Tell us about the fellow with the guitar, please. What was his name? George Zola. He was from Johnstown, <coughs> Pennsylvania. And uh, he was a truck driver. He drove a truck. He had a guitar he took over with him, and he had it up against the firewall with the neck out over the over the steering column, you know. And he had a couple of ropes there. He used to tie it there. So <laughs> we got ambushed one day in a... Somebody, the machine got cut loose, it was about five trucks. And George went to get out to open the door. When they opened fire, he pushed the door open, and a couple of slugs went through the door. So he closed the door and jumped out this side, and we're laying in the ditch while this machine gun's went up. Nobody sticking their head up or anything. And all these things kept saying, I hope they didn't get my guitar. <laughs> There was, everyone was worried about getting killed, and he was worried about him ruining his skin tone. <laughs> he, he was a nice kid. He was, his name was George Zola. He was a private. So whenever anything came up, they'd go uh, rank and then alphabetical order, you know. And the rank, George was a surprise. <laughs> and when they started to sign something, say, of signing the payroll, we said, okay. He'd sit there for 20 minutes before he even went over. But he's going to be the last one. He was the last one everything that signed alphabetically. But some of the guys, I mean, you felt sorry for. We had a kid by the name of Zuno Hoots from somewhere in Tennessee. He was with a dead detail. And it bothered him from the first day he started picking up dead to the last day he picked up. He, uh, he just couldn't, just couldn't put it aside. I mean, it, you had to feel sorry for the guy. Well, the captain wouldn't take him off the detail. He kept going to detail, and he was on that detail all the time. Now, you know who they must. Was that death detail? Now, was that part of the company operation? Yeah. Her <coughs> division. No, uh, <coughs> regiment. 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 Okay. okay. We picked up everybody in the, in the 330th regiment. The. Uh, they just had a regular truck. We had this guy, Charlie Banks, was, they drove the truck and in charge of the, they finally made him sergeant, but he's, I don't know, they made him sergeant because of you know, the job he had, really. And uh, he was hard-hearted as hell. And we were there one day, they were unloading bodies, and they were throwing them off, and, and uh, Charlie Banks said, wait a minute, maybe this guy will need that. And he threw an arm out. Just an arm. He said to me one day, he said, Sam Bowley said, you're pretty, pretty brainy, aren't you? I said, no. No, I said, why, why do you want to know, Charlie? He said, not real, nothing really. He said, I got the brains laying up in the front of the truck and told me, you might want them. <laughs> he, he was a character. He was a character. <clears throat> yeah. It was, it was quite an experience. I don't want to get. Well, is there anything else you think you'd like to put on your recording? No, I shouldn't have put all that on, I guess. <laughs> one, more, one more story. Here we go. You're in Tennessee maneuvers, and the typical American boy walks down the road. Oh, 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 oh yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were in Tennessee on maneuvers, and we were, we were camped in a, a, a schoolyard. It was one room school and there was just dirt, there was nothing there. And uh, this big Jim Hughes that I was talking about, him and I were arguing about uh, vocalist. And uh, I said, boy, there'll never be a better guy than Bing Crosby. He said, oh, he said, Bing Crosby said, he didn't say, Roy Acuff. I said, get out of here, you know, it's no comparison. He said, well, he said, well, well, I asked this, he said, here comes a typical American boy, and the kid was coming to school, had his bare feet and a pair of suspenders <laughs> and no shirt on. He said, this is a typical American boy. <laughs> so he said to the kid, he said, boy, he said, how do you like Bing Crosby? And the kid said, Bing Crosby? 
He said, yeah, Bing Crosby, the singer. He said, Bing Crosby. And he said, how do you like Roy Acuff? He said, boy, he's good, ain't he? <laughs> <laughs> he? He never heard of Bing Crosby. <laughs> Typical American boy, his bare feet, his bare suspended from <laughs> going to school. Typical American boy. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, about four colored kids in the same class as us, and we were we were on what they call main post, big, enormous barracks. I mean, tile floors and showers and all that kind of stuff. And we would walk past, and they had wooden shacks with the colored ones, in, and we'd pick up those four guys to go to class with us. They'd come back, we'd drop them off at them shacks, and we'd go back to the big. That's how bad it was then. And that was in 43. They had different barracks than you guys. Yeah. You had the two-story clapboard buildings and... It was back here, yeah. And they were living in... No, back there, no, we had big stone cement barracks oh, with okay. tile floors, oh, I showers. <clears throat> it was great. I mean, it was a main po it was called main post, you know. It was, it was the, the biggest part of, of Fort Benning, Georgia we were on for the motor schools and all. And these colored fellas, we'd, we'd walk down about, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile, I guess, and with the, these toy paper shacks for what they stayed in. Mm. And we'd pick them up and take them to motor school with us and drop them off on the way up. They were doing exactly the same thing we were, and they, they lived in shacks. That's unbelievable, isn't it? And it was to me, I mean, you know. When, uh, another thing, when I was, we were going down to Georgia, we were on the uh, Louisville and Nashville Railroad, and uh, it was a one-lane track. You went so far, and they pulled over on the side while the train come the other way, went past. And they had uh, prisoners out there in striped suits working on the railroad. Now that was 43, 44, 43. Well, you know, I, I thought that stuff was way back in the 1900s somewhere, you know. I didn't think that they were still up, but they still had convicts. Convicts working on the railroad in striped suits and chains on them. I, I thought that was awful. Of course, I went to school with colored kids and all, you know, and they were the same as we were when I went to school. Got your chair. Got my chair. Uh, it could be a, one of me when I stepped off the jeep somewhere one day in Normandy, somebody took a picture of me. These are all so faded anymore. You would have got an album and just huh? me. put that in, a, in an album, writing them 